There are many ways to tell a story. The most ancient of peoples, long since vanished, still speak to us through their tools of flint and the household shards which they left behind. Others have left us temples and monuments or reveal themselves through their paintings, their sculptures, their songs, or the written word. But sounds, too, are a part of all life. And while the sounds of history are gone with the winds that bore them, we can reconstruct enough of them from our own experience to tell the story of our forebears through sound. From the time of their arrival upon this continent, through their trials and tribulations and triumphs. The CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination. The theater of the mind. Today, a re-evocation through sound of some of the significant themes in the development of our country. The title, Sounds of a Nation. The bells are ringing throughout the land this week. Hundreds of bells, thousands of bells, tens, perhaps hundreds of thousands of bells. From the clear, joyous village bell, as pure as virgin landscape, to the majestic choirs cast in bronze of the big city cathedrals. The little bells are ringing too the proud, forlorn little schoolhouse bells which do double and triple duty on our lonely prairies and in the close-held hills and swamps of our south, calling the children to school, the grown-ups to their meetings and votings, and both old and young to their prayers. You too, amigo, speak out, firm over the sun-seared desert, Long since gone are the unhappy days when your pioneering mission voice calling man to penance clashed with the less somber tones of the bells which others brought from their homelands. We all now rejoice together. There were no bells in Plymouth, Massachusetts in late October of 1621. Eleven buildings there comprised a new colony. Seven private dwellings, each eight feet wide, and four built for public use. These, like the homes, constructed of wattle and mud and roofed with bark. Fifty-odd souls still survived of more than a hundred who together had landed there just ten months before. There were no bells, but there was faith. And there was jollity, as they called it then, when the first harvest had at last been secured. If the rain but hold off. James. I was but learning the call to arms. Leave thou the calling to Captain Standish. Fetch thou some wood for the fire instead. I truly pray to heaven. That it may not rain, I know. Or it might be snow. Leave thou the praying to those who might be more in the habit of it. No, James. Logs go on what the fire the fine, Priscilla? Tis cooling in the brook, not the red. Tis airing in the shade. Keep thou an eye on it. With all those... Oh, well. It ill behooves to speak evil of God's children. It do perplex me how our Lord, who otherwise so ill favored this land, found fit to bestow upon it such wondrous grapes. And them heathens never Gosh. knowing. Mysterious are his ways. Is it true that the heathen chief is joining us at table? Him and that other one, Sequoit? Hush. Sequoit be an Indian, Priscilla, but he is no heathen. Had Sequoit not won us the friendship of Chief Massasoit and his Wampanoag, it is not likely we would be here now, idling in We'd gossip. We'd be up on yon hill, most likely, with the others, under the sod of this cruel land. Aye. But if the, the chief brings some of his men, as he is wont to, there will not be enough game. <laughs> Lord and his 
Massasoit showed up with no fewer than 90 of his selected braves, each one twice as hungry as any pilgrim. But as soon as the Indians found out that there was really not enough food for the kind of slam-bang feast they'd expected, they cheerfully offered to help bring in more. And so together, pilgrim and Indian set out to the forest. The Indians alone brought in four deer, plus no one counted how much other game, and the pilgrims contributed their share, not least of all a supply of the potent wines which they had learned to concoct from the abundant native grapes. The feast lasted three full days, with a half hundred half-starved English pilgrims and ninety odd Indians, stuffing themselves as they had rarely been stuffed before, with venison and roast goose, roast duck and fricasseed squirrel, with blackfish and eel, clams and oysters and other shellfish, with white bread and cornbread, boiled corn and roast corn, wild leeks and onions and watercress, mint, wild plums, dried berries, and always the potent wine. It was a glorious three days. More than 300 Thanksgiving festivals have been celebrated on this continent, which at first seemed so harsh and limitless since that first memorable brawl in Plymouth. Each generation since 1621 has, of course, created its own pattern of living with its own sounds. But the basic sounds, most expressive of the things for which Americans have given thanks each fall, have always returned certain common characteristics. Exuberance about life, a willingness to face the unknown, a fascination with building and creating, and a faith in the limitless possibilities of experience. The clean, sharp bite of a well-honed axe notching the living tissue of forest trees, some as straight and pure as Gothic columns. They felled them to make masts for the world's swiftest sailing ships, or building lumber, or paper pulp, or just firewood, or to clear new land for the planting. And the saws, the busy saws, hand saws, band saws, two-man saws, power saws, cutting an endless supply of boards and planks for more and more homes, in more and more towns, for more and more Americans. And the mallets, first wood, then iron, driving the stakes which in the course of a few generations made a checkerboard of the new continent, a squared off flag of private domains. Then the hammers, driving pegs and nails to fix the fences, fix the shingles, fix the barns, beating out the iron rims for the wagon wheels. Beating out rims for the wagon wheels that could travel across the land on roads of clay or sand, humped with rocks, or no roads at all. Carrying the ebb and flow of new world humanity, precious produce, and that eternal verity, the mail. Ho, oh, Caesar! Ho, oh, you piss! Ho oh, now, here! People are waiting for us! Tens of millions of us know this sound, the blacksmith shaping a red-hot arc of iron into a horseshoe. The conquest of the land and the fencing of it, the building of homes and of the furnishings to make them livable, the never-ceasing cross-country movement of people and of goods, all these produced sounds which are part of our heritage. And there is yet another sound which our forefathers bequeathed to us. The sound of firearms. The pilgrims used the blunderbuss, inaccurate but loud. Then came the flintlock, the straight shooting rifle, the handy carbine, the pistol, and the revolver. All of them too often misused in needless slaughter, most of all of Indians and of buffalo. Got about 400 head, I guess. But look at here, boss. Look at what? Well, ain't nobody around can eat that much buffalo. Hides bring 50 cents apiece, don't they? You mean all them bison? Yeah, all them bison. 
Not all of the gunshots heard on the continent, of course, were fired in unworthy causes. In April 1775, in a small Massachusetts town named Lexington, a salvo was fired that was heard around the world. In the amazement of the world, a badly trained, highly individualistic band of New World settlers defeated an organized body of British regular soldiers sent against them to confiscate their stores of powder and shot. Once having chosen freedom in preference to security, the settlers fought on through a bitter seven-year war. These are the times that try men's souls. A summer soldier and a sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of their country. But he who now stands... Independence was finally attained by the early settlers of our land, a one-ton bell in the State House in Philadelphia rang out loud and clear. It was rung after that at every important occasion in the development of the new United States. But the bell had always been brittle, and in 1835 it cracked for good. Now, when the symbolic sound of this broken token of man's will to freedom is wanted, it is only struck gently with rubber mallets, but the sound of its voice, however cracked, has attained a worldwide significance. With independence achieved, the eyes of many descendants of the Plymouth settlers and those who had come after them turned westward to the empty lands beyond the Appalachians, which had been ceded to the nation as far as the banks of the Mississippi, and then swept on across the river to the still vaster, even emptier regions, which stretched to what seemed like the end of the world, the shore of the great Western Ocean. to make out his fears. Oh, I don't mind. Just let me get my feet on the ground. Hitch Pluggy, help. Yeah. You're new, ain't you? They just pulled in. Bert's the name, Bert Lehrer, from Greene County, Pennsylvania. Right close by the Virginia line. I'm from Kentucky myself. They call me Little Bad Dave. Huh? <laughs> just joshing like. Coming all the way to Oregon? Sure am, if the old wagon holds together. Oh, seems like that's what's wearing the most of us. That and them engines. That's what's got my old lady Florence all worked up. This was Independence, Missouri, in 1846. Those who assembled there came from everywhere, and they brought everything. Their families, their belongings, their hopes and dreams, and even their cattle. And when they finally embarked on the western trail, they carried the mark of destiny upon them. It was not an easy trip, and not all survived it. Enough of them did, however, to build an empire. By this time, the eastern coast of the continent was dotted with cities, with cobbled streets and gracious three-story houses and other modern conveniences, including slums. There were Boston and Philadelphia, Charleston and Savannah, Baltimore and New Orleans, and oh yes, of course, New York. Life was gentler there, with good manners and parties, and a gentleman, of course, had a carriage. <laughs> it has been a delightful evening. You flatter me, sir, but so delightfully. My carriage is waiting outside. May I 
Might I be permitted to drive you home? Sir, I... Well, I suppose it would be all. The cobbled streets at times, though, had to carry more serious burdens than amorous young men and women. There were four tragic years when the young union was rent by discord. Brother fought brother. The cities, of course, were prime targets. Get up, you general needs in guns. The bloody fraternal strife was ended at last. It sounds never again to be heard in the land. One nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. New sounds by then had joined the National Symphony. Ever-increasing numbers of devoted men of many nations and varied antecedents had long been pushing against the frontiers of human knowledge and skill. And now the age of invention was at hand, and our young nation was seizing it as its own. Three generations before, a Scotsman named James Watt had learned to harness the power of steam to make it work for the benefit of man. And a Yankee, Eli Whitney was his name, had designed a piece of simple machinery which freed countless thousands in the course of time from the drudgery of cleaning cotton by hand. The spinning of the clean cotton and other textile fibers into thread for the weaving had been attended to by an Englishman, among others, James Hargraves by name. A baker's dozen of other men, working each on his own, produced a baker's dozen of ideas, which in the aggregate made the weaving of the thread into cloth too a mechanized process. Here in New England, just like I hear it in the old country, we took all them ideas about ginnings and spinning and weaving, put them all together. Got us a steam engine. And the result was a flood of inexpensive fabrics, dazzling to the feminine eye. Assistant Robert Fulton, having heard of experiments conducted by others, had installed a steam engine on a riverboat and hitched it up to side paddle wheels. He had turned the waters of the world, regardless of winds and currents, into fast, dependable highways for the transport of goods and travelers. And a fella called Stevenson over in England or somewhere started pulling whole wagon trains with one of them steam dinguses. A locomotive, he called it. He put them on rails first, of course. Well, Siri Bob, you couldn't put one like that over on us. We had the same kind of things running down to Washington almost before the old Baltimore could get its last horse off on them wooden tracks. And then from Albany to Schenectady, and back on down to New York, and out to Buffalo and Chicago the other way. And then still further west, until, believe it or not, in 1869, they drove in a golden spike out there in Utah someplace and joined up two of them rail lines. About this time, too, a closer and closer knit spider web of copper wire began to cover the length and breadth of the continent. Hello, hello. Operator. Hello, please, I want San Diego. Atlanta is calling. Operator, please. Hello, operator. Symbolic among the many strange sounds which were forming a new pattern for the country's age of invention and industry which we still live, was one in particular. This is the sound of a monumental trip hammer, weighing many tons, built to temper and shape the steel which was asserting itself as the world's new master. The backbone of national economies, the measure of their prestige, and the gauge by which even a people's potential to wage war was soon to be judged. This sound not only set the tone for the transformation of our nation from a basically agricultural to an industrial one, 
but also quickly became a Pied Piper's melody for work-hungry, peace-hungry, opportunity-hungry men and women throughout the world. They responded by the millions, abandoning their old homes to follow the rainbow trail to the new world and to partake of the new bonanza. The hands and heads of the newcomers helped to make the nation a giant among the world's giants, and also to shape new syllables for the nation's vocabulary of sounds. They took up places amid the awesome rumble of the steel rolling mills. They manned the levers which controlled the doomsday clatter of the sheet steel plants. The newcomers gentled the giant presses which now shape whole quarters of automobile bodies in a single brief embrace, and they steadied the handles of the bone-jarring air-driven chisels and hammers. The newcomers brought with them many skills acquired in their ancient homelands. They learned many new ones from the conquerors of the new continent until the efforts of the two merged in the brotherhood of creative labor, embracing everything from the smallest detail, such as the ingenious testing of the jewel-like steel balls which cut down friction in our machines and transport vehicles. From the smallest to the largest, And even the pilgrims might easily have learned to enjoy that last sound, strange as it would have been to their ears, the factory whistle. It may tyrannize our lives, but it also brings to us the welcome news, it's time to go home. have been listening to the CBS Radio Workshop and the Sounds of a Nation. Sounds of a Nation was written by Henry E. Fritsch, with music adapted and conducted by Alexander Steinert, and produced and directed in New York by Paul Roberts. Louis Van Ruten was heard as the narrator. Others in the cast included Leon Janney, Ruth Tobin, Ralph Bell, Millicent Brower, Herm Dinkin, Raleigh Bester, and Joe Helgeson. This is Dick Noel inviting you to tune in each Sunday afternoon for the CBS Radio Workshop. Your first opportunity since the Israeli-Egyptian War to hear Israel's point of view expressed by her ambassador, Abba Eben, in a live question-and-answer session will come to you tonight on Face the Nation. For another timely interview with a key figure in the news, hear Face the Nation on most of these same stations tonight. Stay tuned for Suspense, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. America listens most to the CBS radio network.